Hello, and welcome to the video. A compelling reason for the Riemann hypothesis to be true? Otherwise known as, please YouTube, tell me all of the things that I have gotten wrong. The Riemann hypothesis, a holy grail of mathematics, holding deep links to the distribution of the prime numbers, and unproven since first conjectured by Bernhard Riemann in 1859. Subject of many attempted proofs and disproofs, and associated with a $1 million prize from the Clay Mathematics Institute. Simply stated, the Riemann hypothesis asserts that all the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function will be found with a real part of the input equaling one half. This means we will never find a zero for an input with a real part of one third, four ninths, 4,501 over 9,999, or indeed any real valued input other than one half. This is quite advanced mathematics, and I encourage you to look at 3 Blue 1 Brown's video and the Quanta video to understand more of the background and importance of this function and its deep relationship to the prime numbers. Of course, I'm making a very big claim here that I will show you a reason for the truth of the hypothesis. My primary focus will be on visualization of the function and determining what, if any, pattern can be found in the behavior of this most chaotic of functions. What I am not claiming is formal proof of the hypothesis. In essence, I am responding to John Littlewood, who after much investigation of the zeta function stated that there was no imaginable reason for it to be true. So without further ado, let's take a look at the zeta function itself. So let's start by looking at the zeta function on the line of one half. This is the line formed by fixing the real part of the input to the function at one half and varying the imaginary value of the input. In the parlance of the hypothesis, this is the critical line. Running on your screen now, you can see a representation of the input and output values for the zeta function along this critical line. As the imaginary part can take positive and negative values, you can see these incrementing on the input plane as we increase the imaginary input to the function. And what we see is a very chaotic appearing output. We can see the first zero of the function at 14.134 and the second zero at 21.022. Obviously we are not observing the actual zero of the function, as this would require real imaginary input that we can only approximate computationally. But if you have a passing interest in the hypothesis, you will have seen similar animations in the past. You may also have seen visualizations of the whole of the critical strip this being the strip of the complex plane with real parts between 0 and 1. And previous results have proven that any non-trivial zeros of the zeta function must lie within this critical strip. What I would like to do is investigate how the zeta function behaves within the critical strip. And to do this, I will look at other real lines within the strip. Yes, I know I am only looking at rational numbers, not real inputs which I could never actually achieve computationally anyway. But I think by the end of the video, you will see why this is a valid approach. So let's see what it looks like if we add the bounds of the critical strip, 0 and 1. The first key observation we can make is that all three of the lines now seem to move in something approximating unison. We can see the half line turn and curl, and we can see the 0 and 1 lines moving in sympathy with its path. It does seem that there is a tight relationship between the movement of all the lines. What we can also see is the symmetric behaviour of the 0 and 1 lines. Firstly, we can see that for positive and negative inputs, there is mirror symmetry between the output values of the function. Indeed, with more time to animate, 
we could fold the bottom of the output plane onto the top of the output plane and find direct correspondence between the values of a given real line. This is a known result in that we can conjugate the input to the function, meaning change the sign of the imaginary part of the input, and we will still see the conjugate value on the output plane. Now, let's start looking at some of the other lines within the critical strip. How about one third? And let's add two thirds as well. As we will see shortly from the definition of the zeta function, it is a fact that there is mirror symmetry between the output of a given input value and the output of one minus that value. So two third mirrors one third. Again, we can see the synchronicity in the movement of the one third and two third lines around the half line. I'll only be using short clips of the animations for this video, but I have also posted longer versions of all of these clips for those who wish to see the patterns more fully. So moving on, let's try some other values. How about the fifths? Here we see the lines of one fifth, two fifth, three fifth, and four fifth. We ignore zero over five and five over five, as these are simply the zero and one lines that we have already seen. Again, we see the same synchronicity in the movement. There does seem to be some intimate relationship between the values of the function at a given imaginary input and the range of real input values we can provide. Let's dive deeper. Let's look at 49 over 100 and 51 over 100. Here I have reduced the length of the trailing line as we need to zoom in closer to see the separation between the output lines. But again we see the same behaviour. It appears that these lines will never cross each other at a single imaginary input. How about 499 over 1000? And 501 over 1000? Again we see the same behaviour. This is becoming something of a pattern. And also 4,999 over 10,000 with 5,001 over 10,000. Again, we see the same behavior. So my assertion is that the output lines within the critical strip, and indeed outside the critical strip too, will never cross each other. What would this mean? Well, it would mean that as they never cross, they can never take the same value. And as they can never take the same value, this value can never be zero. And as we know that there are zeros on the half line, wouldn't this be a good reason for the Riemann hypothesis to be true? Which leaves us with a conjecture that all lines in the critical strip, except in the half line, can never meet for a given value of imaginary input, thus showing that zeros can only occur on the half line. So this is interesting, but it is rather fanciful speculation. How could we prove this? Let's move on and consider the definition of the zeta function itself. This is a definition of the Riemann zeta function. It can be referred to as the asymmetric functional equation, as there is also a symmetric version, but we won't be looking at that for now. What we see is a mass of complex mathematical symbols. Let's decompose it. The first part on the left of the equal sign is quite simple. The symbol is the Greek character for zeta and the input is one value, s. This value is complex and hence it has a real and imaginary part. So far so good. But what about the other side of the equation? The first component of this is simply 2 raised to the power of the input value. The second component is pi raised to the power of the input value minus 1. The third component is the sine of pi multiplied by the input value divided by 2. The fourth component is the gamma function of 1 minus the input value. The gamma function being the complex extension of the factorial function. 
And finally, we see zeta appear again, but for an input value of 1 minus s. This equation shows the connection between the values of zeta at a given input value and at 1 minus that input value. Let's rejiggle it a bit and see that the non-zeta components of the function are actually equal to zeta s over zeta 1 minus s. So now our function on the right hand side is equal to the result of dividing an output value of zeta with the output of its mirror value. Let's have a look at this function and see if we can find anything interesting. For shorthand, I will refer to this function as the reflection formula. Let's take a look at it along the half line. I have now dispensed with the input plane on your screen. As you know, we are just following real lines within the critical strip. The first thing that stands out is how the half line simply draws a circle in the output space. Indeed, this is trivial to prove as dividing a complex number by its conjugate will always result in an absolute value of 1, as the conjugates have an identical absolute value in the first place. The second thing we can see is that the direction of the spin of the output moves from anti-clockwise to clockwise at an imaginary value of 2 pi. This is intriguing. We see the spin invert, but from our small window into the output, we have no idea whether this is a single inversion or whether the output changes direction multiple times. In my view, but lacking any formal proof, this is a one-time only event. After 2 pi, the half line will continue circling clockwise until infinity. Let's look at some of our other input lines. How about 0 and 1? As for the zeta function itself, we see that there is a relationship between the 0 and 1 lines and the half line. Indeed, shortly after 2 pi, we see that both of these lines cross the unit circle. It is the behaviour after this that I am particularly interested in. From this point, we will see both lines moving in synchrony with the half line. Indeed, they seem to be trailing the half line. And more than that, they appear to be progressively moving away from the half line which implies that, relatively, these lines will move away from each other as the imaginary input increases. What about the thirds and the fourths? Obviously 2 over 4 is not shown, as this is the half line itself. Again, we see the same behaviour. The lines cross the unit circle, just after 2 pi, and then progressively spiral in and out. One more obvious statement, as this is the result of dividing the absolute values of the symmetric inputs, we can never reach zero on the inside of the unit circle. So again, we show that the lines do not meet. Let's look at our hundredths. Again with the trailing line dialed back. Surprise, surprise, the same behaviour. And the thousandths, again, the same behaviour. And the ten thousandths, we again see the same pattern unfurling. So it appears that the reflection formula itself shows all lines in the critical strip progressively getting further and further away from each other. Behaviour that can kind of be inferred from looking at the zeta function itself, but shown here much more clearly. What is happening here? Let's break down the reflection formula to see if we can garner more understanding. Let's start by looking at the power of two component of the reflection formula. We don't need to look at much here. Let's see what happens if we view 0, 1, the half line, the thirds and the fifths. Now there is a compelling pattern. All of these real inputs trace circles in the output plane. Indeed, this is pretty trivial. We know that when raising 2 to a complex power, the absolute value of the output will be 2 to the power of the real part of the input. So we can see 0 traces the unit circle, 
1 traces the circle of absolute value 2. And for the rest, well, let's take a look at the thirds. 1 third means raising 2 to the first power, i.e. 2, and then taking the cube root of that. So for 1 third, we have an absolute value of the cube root of 2. 2 thirds means raising 2 to the second power, i.e. 4. Then take the cube root of 4. So for 2 thirds, we have an absolute value of the cube root of 4 and so on and so forth, with the conclusion that for this component, each real input results in a constant absolute value of the output. So no help here in explaining the spiral behaviour in the full output of the reflection formula. What about the component that is a power of pi? Once again, let's see what happens if we view 0, 1, the half line, the thirds and the fifths. Here the calculation is a bit more complex, as we are subtracting 1 from the input value. But the result, once again, is that each input line results in a circle with constant absolute value. Again, this function is a little help in understanding the spiralling, but we can now exclude both the power of 2 and the power of pi from the function, given that it is the spiralling that is the core of our argument. Let's see what the reflection formula looks like if we remove the power of 2 and power of pi. We see the same spiral in behaviour as previously, but it is subtly distorted. Nevertheless, we have now constrained our investigation to the gamma and sine portions of the function. Let's look at the sine function first. Here we see an animation of the sine component of the reflection formula as the imaginary input increases. We can see some very clear behaviour here. We may ask what will happen to values of the function as the imaginary input continues to increase, but we know the answer to this. What we are effectively looking at is the hyperbolic sine function, and we know that this continues increasing all the way to infinity. The value of this function will never reduce. What we see is that for real values less than one half, the imaginary part of the output is always greater than the value at one half. And for real values greater than one half, the imaginary part of the output is always less than one half. This is interesting. In the combined result of the gamma and sine parts of the reflection equation, we see lines greater than one half spiralling inwards and lines less than one half spiralling outwards. This seems to be one part of the answer, and yet the values of the sine function simply get bigger and bigger, and we see little real artefact of this in the combined equation. So what is going on with the gamma function? So here is the gamma function. I'm showing multiple values again. Further videos are available on the channel for those interested. What we can see here is that the gamma function describes a spiral around zero as the imaginary input increases. And we also see firm regularity in how each of the lines spiral in relation to the others. I have no proof for this, but I believe that this behaviour will continue to infinity, with the gamma function output constantly approaching zero, but never able to reach it. And now we see how the gamma function component balances the ever-increasing sine output to produce the spirals we see in the combined equation. And just to add fuel to the fire, there is something special about the gamma function on the half line. Its value at one half, with zero imaginary input, is the square root of pi. Not a very compelling fact on its own, but coupled with what else we've seen, certainly a good reason for the truth of the Riemann hypothesis. And, in a sense, this is the end of the video. This is my understanding of the Riemann zeta function, and my reason for the truth of the Riemann hypothesis. Relatively symmetric pairs across the half line continually move further and further away from each other after an imaginary input of just over 2 pi. And they never stop moving away from each other. This means that as the smaller part of the pair gets closer and closer to zero, 
the larger part, will also get closer and closer. But they can never reach zero, as each step closer to zero the smaller part gets, the larger part gets relatively further away from it. Let's review what we have seen. We have seen that there is synchronicity in the movement of each real line in the critical strip as the imaginary input value increases. We have used the reflection formula to show that as the imaginary input increases, all real lines move progressively further and further away from each other, in a relative sense. In effect, the reflection equation represents the background that the zeta function resides in, and this background has a constant of expansion as the imaginary input increases. We have argued that as there is relative pressure between the lines in the critical strip, these lines can never cross each other at any imaginary input. And, as they can never cross each other, they can never cross at an output of zero. And given this, the Riemann hypothesis must be true. But before we finish, let's look at the function from another angle. The majority of this video has been spent tracing straight lines in the complex plane. Now what I would like you to see what happens when we trace circles. Let's resurrect our input plane to make clear what we are doing. And let's focus on the upper right quadrant of the complex plane. We know there is mirror symmetry between the top and bottom halves of the complex plane for this function. We also know there is mirror symmetry across the half line through the functional equation. So we feel justified in considering the upper right quadrant alone. What we see is the output of the zeta function with the critical strip painted onto it. It seems to crack like a whip. We also see that it is only the half line that intersects with the origin. But we have already seen this for the infinitesimal slice of the complex plane we have looked at in the video. What is clear from this view is how all the values of the zeta function between 1 and infinity are squashed around 1. 1 indeed is the limit for the zeta function as the real value increases to infinity, regardless of the imaginary input. So here again, we see the relative behaviour of the zeta function, and if we did look at the upper half of the plane as a whole, we see the following. The left upper quadrant of the plane balloons in size as we increase the imaginary input, which is just what we expect from our investigation into the reflection equation. I don't know, maybe some of you will find this view to be more compelling than my main argument. I'd like to thank 3Blue1Brown for inspiring me to produce this video, although I am very much piggybacking on his Summer of Math Exposition competition rather than seriously entering this video. I'd also like to thank Mythologer, Numberphile, Michael Penn and many other YouTubers who have provided valuable background and really opened up the world of advanced mathematics to me. For now, leave a comment Give me a like, subscribe to the channel, and if you can help to fully formalise the argument, I would very much appreciate it. After over 150 years of resistance, I hope that the Riemann hypothesis is now ready to fall to a formal proof. Thank you very much for viewing, and goodbye.